How is uh, innovation affecting your tr the transactions you're doing as far as size, scale, and volume of transactions? Any, any comments on that? I mean, I know it's out there and I know it's going to, uh, in the future, we're going to have a major effect on it. But right now, what, what are you seeing? Yeah, I mean, we, we've built out a 50-person team of just only focused on data science. And so what we'll do is we'll give them different data sets uh, from our portfolio companies. And if you pool all of Blackstone's portfolio companies and employees, I think we're the third largest employer in the U.S. behind Walmart and Amazon. And so that's a lot of data and information. And so we'll take all these different data points from all across the world and different sectors, let our data science team analyze them and then help produce outcomes. And that informs you know, investment decisions, how to manage portfolio companies, uh, pricing. Um, and so all of those things are very important and we'll continue to do that. I mean, you'll see that outside of healthcare and life sciences where I spend my time, I mean, Blackstone's the largest owner of, of data science, uh, uh, um, data mining capabilities and, and properties globally. And so you'll, you'll start to see you know, more things outside of just general healthcare as well, um, where people need to spend time in order to be productive as well. We continue to expect to see disruptive innovation come from innovative teams, uh, typically small companies. I think companies with three, four, five million in revenue that have proven an ROI with an insurance company, a hospital system, a physician group, or others that have a, a better technology um, are where we expect to see the best investment returns. And I, I think the challenge for very large organizations, although they have the budgets for innovation, a lot of innovation um, cannibalizes existing business. So that's made it historically hard. So we, we, we look for those innovators that are starting to have an impact, that have a lot of growth ahead of them. We expect a large company will wind up acquiring them one day, but that the, the, the real innovation is going to come from those smaller teams that, that are, are focused on disrupting the status quo and not from the companies that are benefiting from the status quo. And that's probably the way it's been in most of these type of where you have changing markets, usually that's the way it, it works. Ex I would exactly, imagine. yep. I, so I would add on that and say, I think it will be barbelled. So this is, this is the one opportunity in my mind where for five, 10 years, you've been saying IBM, Microsoft, Salesforce, Google, et cetera, will come into healthcare. They, they have and they will, but from a strictly technology perspective, going to Jonathan's point, scale matters, right? And so if you're a 3 million revenue company, you will innovate, you will have a specific technology that is best of breed and you will probably be acquired. But in terms of 80 data scientists or a thousand da data scientists, right? Scale is just transformative and Google will start signing partnerships they have with an HCA, which is the largest for-profit health system in this country, right? You're gonna start to see more of that where you have scale, billions of dollars invested in R&D and that start to enter the space, which is great because it's much needed. Yeah, I think on the you know chasing innovation side of the investment piece, it's it's we've seen less activity in the past two years than you would think, given all of the hype and you know re requisite hype and appropriate hype around the change in technology. But I think there's some apprehension from investors of the fear of those scaled players that something about that's going to be insurmountable. So on year three or four of my hold, does Google or Amazon take? completely dominate that market that I had a good run at for two and a half years. So I think there's some apprehension on that. That also creates a really high diligence bar of just stress testing that technology on that $3 million revenue business to begin with. And then the third piece that's really slowing all this down is just a lack of reconciliation on price expectations of that innovative three to $5 million revenue company and where tech multiples are today. So I think because of that, we're seeing less activity, but a lot of chatter and things will happen uh, but from the banking perspective, haven't quite seen it yet. It's actually, just I'll hit that, it's a great point, right? So if you think about, let's give an example. There's, there's something in this country called telesitting, right? Where, and scribes. So they pay, you know, low wage employers to sit there in a hospital with the clinician and, and, and the patient sitting and just typing, right? Do you think that'll be there in 10 years? Probably not. But if you're a hundred million revenue company and 20 of EBITDA doing tell us, you know, scribe, uh, scribe or sitting, um, is that a good investment for the next three to five years? Maybe, right? Because those folks may nuance and others may not be able to truly extrapolate that into structured text in a way that it's understand it's understandable for the patient. 
in the next three to five years, 10 years probably, right? So I think it's a great hypothetical of, if you're an investor, it's, a, it's an interesting paradox where these businesses may not exist in 10 years, but they're fundamentally great cash flowing businesses, right? And so if you're a lender, what is the true underwritable risk? I, I don't know, right? It's, it's, a, it's an interesting thing to think about in the context of AI, um, you know, not necessarily supercharging, but pot potentially displacing industries.